So we're in our third week of Advent, and as many of you probably already know that this is a time of waiting, and we remind ourselves of the people who waited originally for the Savior. And we're also still awaiting uh, our Christ, our Savior, our Messiah's return. And in our waiting, um, and I think the, the four things, the th or the things that we cover, we're on the theme of joy today. The four things are often tested when you wait. Your, your hope when waiting, your hope can be tested, and your love gets tested, and, and your joy gets tested. And it's easy to have hope and love and joy and peace when things are going well, and things are going as you expect them to go. But sometimes when we're in difficult situations, that's when we find it difficult to hold on to those, those themes, those principles. And so this morning, I want to just kind of tackle and maybe unpack a little bit of the joy that we can find in, in our relationship with our everlasting Father. And I, I know that for, um, for many of us, at least in, in our Price Hill community and some of the younger generations, whenever you bring up the subject of a father, it brings up all kinds of mixed emotions. Not everyone has had a positive experience with their father, and so I always have to kind of tread lightly and really do some, some framing. And, and so I don't want to uh, offend your sensibilities or assume anything, but let me uh, just spend a little time unpacking what I mean by the father according to the text here. Um, Isaiah, the name Isaiah means God is salvation. So when you look at the book of Isaiah, we're looking at the stories, we're looking at the word of God, we're looking at the prophecies of how God will save God's people. And it came through the prophet Isaiah, and I think that when, as we look at the text today, we can look at God's plan and God's process and God's purpose for salvation. God wants to save us so that we can have a relationship, an intimate relationship with God. That's what we're designed to have. And many things will separate us and, and try to woo us away from that relationship, but God is always trying to bring us back into an intimate relationship with God. And if we're going to have an intimate relationship with anyone, you have to spend time with them and you have to share parts of yourself with them. You reveal your heart and your mind, and that's what God has done here in the book of Isaiah. And God sends this willing person out to preach his word to say, this is what I, I plan for you. This is what I want for you. And, and, and in return, you'll, you'll, you'll reciprocate. You'll obey. And, and we'll have a really great relationship. But you guys know, easier said than done, right? It's one thing to know the law. It's one thing to know the word. It's another thing to actually do it. And so when you read Isaiah chapters 1 through 8, you see that there is this gloom that's all over the community, all over the people. They're divided. You have the northern tribe and the southern tribe. And the word for the southern tribe, the name was Judah. And that word means praise. And when life happens to hinder your praise, then we have a problem. When we find ourselves at a situation or a time in life where we're complaining more than we're praising, we've got a problem. Because life is going to continue to happen. We can't stop that. But we can decide how we respond to life. And so the, the, the tribe of Judah, they were being led by King Ahaz, and he was full of fear. There was dread throughout. There was a lot of blasphemy and distress and debate because the northern tribe was hooking up with another country, and they wanted the king Ahaz and the, and the tribe of Judah to join them in overthrowing a superpower. And so they were politicking, and they planned to go in and attack, and the tribe of Judah was a small tribe. And the king was really concerned, but the king was full of mess. The king was not committed to God. The king worshiped other gods and, and didn't tear down the, uh, the altars of other foreign idols. And so God sends Isaiah to him, and he tells him, Isaiah says to him, King, don't worry. Just trust God. Seems simple, right? Don't worry. Just trust God. But the king didn't have an intimate relationship with God to even trust God. The king was divided by all these other gods. 
And so this wasn't necessarily good news, and the people wanted him to go and consult with the other wizards and sorcerers and, and soothsayers, the, the psychics, and, and find out what, what is going to happen. Are we going to defeat the, the army from the north, or are we going to be able to defeat the Assyrian armies? What's going to happen? This, our one God hasn't saved us, hasn't secured his promise, so we have to go and do it ourselves. And then Isaiah says to him in chapter 7, verse 14, there will be a virgin or a young lady, and she'll give birth to a son. And she will call him Emmanuel, which means that God is with us. And people rejected the sign. They rejected God's protection and God's promise. And so God responds in chapter 8 and says, well, then this Assyrian army that you're so afraid of, they're going to overtake you, and they're going to defeat you, and they're going to lay your, your city waste, and they'll enslave your children. And the king and the tribe of Judah 